Hey there, my name is James Lee. Welcome to my channel 5149 where I talk business, politics, and society. No glasses for me today. They literally just kind of snapped in half. So sad. But no worries, another one is coming and uh, yeah, enough about me. Anyway, about a year ago in one of my first videos on this channel, I talked about how Trader Joe's prioritized profits over their workers during the pandemic. And today I wanna to revisit this topic. First, to give an update on some of the truly egregious workers' rights violations that's come to light recently. But second, I think there is a little bit more here to discuss beyond the simple message that, you know, working for Trader Joe's is not really what it seems and that Trader Joe's has continued to exploit workers during the pandemic. Beyond all of that, I think this story also gives me a chance to talk about class, identity, and tolerance, which I'll explain later what I mean by that. So to begin, a quick overview of Trader Joe's for those who maybe don't have one in their area. Welcome to Trader Joe's where super friendly workers help you shop for things like kale gnocchi and vegan tikka masala. Trader Joe's calls itself your neighborhood grocery store, except it's grown way beyond your neighborhood to over 500 stores nationwide. Experts estimate Trader Joe's outsells all of the competition when it comes to sales per square foot. The company brought in estimated total sales of $13.7 billion in 2019. I'm at Trader Joe's right now. The fan fervor around Trader Joe's has consumers begging for more, even starting petitions for new locations. In terms of overall customer satisfaction, Trader Joe's was the highest ranking national brand in Consumer Reports' 2019 ranking of grocery chains. So yeah, Trader Joe's, they truly have built something that really works as a business. Um, I have to admit that I actually do most of my grocery shopping from Trader Joe's. The food is pretty good, it's simple. The people who work there are friendly. It's always a great shopping experience. So, you know, the fact it has kind of this cult following, I get it. So with that being said, it's always disappointing to see a situation like that of Ben Bonima, a Trader Joe's employee who was fired earlier this year for writing a letter to the CEO respectfully suggesting the company adopt a number of additional safety measures to protect employees and shoppers against COVID-19. In his termination letter, the company claimed that he quote unquote, did not understand the company's values. And as a result, they are no longer comfortable having him work at Trader Joe's. Kind of an interesting take from corporate considering one of Trader Joe's corporate values is integrity with a blurb on their website reading, we are dedicated to doing the work every single day to make sure Trader Joe's is an environment that is safe, welcoming, inclusive, and respectful for all crew members and customers. So to me, when dealing with legitimate employee concerns and labor rights issues, it should be pretty out of character for Trader Joe's to resort to threats, interrogations, and straight up termination. But as we're finding out, it's actually not that uncommon. For example, when workers at Trader Joe's flagship location in Pasadena collectively organized to challenge their pandemic era treatment by the company, management responded by interrogating them. I want to dive into this case in more detail because I think the situation is kind of astonishing. So this is from a Jack and a Magazine interview with Alex Pham, an employee at that Trader Joe's location in Pasadena. At our location, we were frustrated, we felt unsafe, and then we felt dismissed when we raised concerns. So right, at the height of the pandemic, workers who were rightfully concerned with the company not following public health measures, things like masking and social distancing, were essentially told by corporate to quote unquote, not be so dramatic. I mean, regardless of your personal opinions on the severity of the pandemic, if you're one of those people who can work from home, in this case, corporate representatives from Trader Joe's, you're gonna be a little bit less stressed out about the pandemic versus someone who has to go in and interact with hundreds of strangers every day. That was part of the impetus for us coordinating responses to the annual survey, which was conducted by a third party in late April. Some of us at my store had agreed that we wanted to bring up grievances in unison, both to keep ourselves safe and to show that many of us had these concerns. We figured it'd be hard to dismiss. I actually think that's really smart because a common tactic used by corporations, people with authority or powerful institutions is to divide and conquer. And that's actually what they try to do here as well. That got back to management and they started interrogating people in a back room of the store over the course of several days. One day they might play good cop and ask, do you know anything that might be lacking in integrity? Wow, this sounds kind of like some, some mafia shakedown here. And they were quite careful about it because uh, like I just mentioned, one of the core values of the company is integrity. And they were clearly trying to phrase the question to make it seem like some people were engaging activities that were in violation of core company values. The next day, the boss shows up on his day off. 
I get text messages before my shift from people who say, the boss is here and he's going really hard. Be ready for grilling. Apparently at this point, he asked to check people's phones. Shortly after I clock in, he has an assistant manager grab me from my section. They phrase it very politely. Can we borrow you for a second? They bring me to a back room. My boss says, we saw some texts and call records indicating that you shared this resource. Why didn't you mention that yesterday? There's some back and forth. I asked, did I violate something? Am I being disciplined? I need to know what I'm being accused of. He knows the legal language and says, I'm not saying that you violated anything yet. This is an ongoing investigation. Let me get this straight. Um, Apple won't unlock iPhones for an FBI terrorist investigation. And here at Trader Joe's, supervisors are rummaging through people's texts and call records because of some responses in an annual survey. This is unreal. Eventually, both Alex and Ben, the worker I mentioned earlier who got fired, filed grievances with the National Labor Relations Board. And Trader Joe's did end up reinstating Ben with back pay and posted a notice reminding employees of their rights as stipulated by the National Labor Relations Act. But you see what they're trying to do. Classic game theory, divide and conquer, trying to bait you into ratting out your fellow workers to save yourself. So with all the issues that come with unions and organized labor, um, after all, it's still run by people, the ability to collectively bargain is really important to ensure a balance of power between capital and labor. Companies talk a lot about economies of scale, and the same idea applies to labor. Um, there's not much a single worker can do on his own to negotiate, but collectively they can fight for better wages, better working conditions, and better benefits. And we see that here with Trader Joe's capitulating to providing their workers with hazard pay, albeit with some strings attached. I always say this, there's a reason why nearly every single company, if not every single company, is anti-union, including Trader Joe's, whose CEO sent a physical letter to every employee discouraging them from unionizing. I'm fairly certain that that letter was not sent as some sort of uh, goodwill advice for workers. It's really a thinly veiled threat. And to me, a fair and free society is predicated on a balance of power. And unfortunately, over the past 40 or 50 years, the power has swung too far in the direction of big business with real hourly pay for the average American lower today than it was in 1973. The result is kind of like this bizarre dance. Like they know, we know that what they're doing isn't quite right. So they continue to use distractionary gestures like diversity initiatives or pseudo sustainability initiatives to distract us from the fact that at the heart of any major business, there's an acceptance that some type of human exploitation is a necessary byproduct of profit maximization. So is it okay to still shop at Trader Joe's? Which gets at the second point I wanted to make about class, identity, and tolerance. Like we talked about earlier, Trader Joe's has quite a cult following from presumably good people who are excited about their products, but also people who I think genuinely care about the well-being of society. The quirky grocery brand has amassed a cult following among health and value conscious shoppers. It's so addicting. Prices and quality put together is unmatched pretty much anywhere else. They just have those random little things that you didn't really know you ever wanted and then you can't somehow live without. Today, we are going to Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's. The ginger snap cookies. The babka is unbelievable. Coconut rolls. Those are my favorite things I've ever had in my life. The little signs with the corny jokes on them. Is that crazy to say? Like, it just has a better vibe. So yeah, people are excited. They're super passionate. But we have to remember, Trader Joe's is not a farmer's market. It's a supermarket owned by a multinational corporation. Trader Joe's presents itself as a quaint local store. The neighborhood market atmosphere helps shoppers feel that they're making healthy and environmentally friendly choices. In terms of sustainability, people have this um, warm, fuzzy feeling and it's kind of reflected in the packaging. When I worked there, we had a product that was non-bread and the non-bread was baked and frozen in India and shipped frozen to Trader Joe's stores. That's pretty crazy. You can bake non-bread anywhere. Trader Joe's may not operate just like a local market, but the experience of being at one helps us feel good about our shopping decisions. Everything that Trader Joe's does is calculated and well-researched in an effort to make you feel good when you shop there, increasing the likelihood of you going there again and thus ultimately increasing their sales. The unique packaging of their products, the cute signs in the store saying bananas are 19 cents, the stuff about the environment and sustainability, it is all just a facade. 
the exploitation of workers is very real at Trader Joe's. So would it be fair for me to say, hey, you know, you shouldn't shop there or because you support a supermarket that exploits their workers, I can't associate with you. Most would probably say, eh, that's probably going a step too far, but that's exactly how some people have reacted to a certain notorious president. A little shift in the topic, I know, but uh, I think it all connects, so stay with me for a second. So I just got back from a date where I discovered that the guy voted for Trump in 2016, and I want to discuss a little bit about why this is a deal breaker for me, specifically. If you voted for Trump in 2016, it means that the racism, sexism, xenophobia, homophobia, transphobia, all of it was not bad enough to stop you from voting for him. I know that's just one random person on TikTok and she is allowed to have her own opinions and deal breakers when it comes to dating, but it's actually not an anomaly and a part of a bigger, more troubling trend in my opinion. According to Pew Research, 71% of Democrats would not consider dating a Trump voter and in general, Americans are less likely to have friends of very different political opinions compared to 2016. Now, the analogy that I'm trying to make here is that these two issues are obviously very different, but also similar in that human beings are being discriminated against and being exploited by the oppressive system that we all live in. Should one of these issues be prioritized over the other? Should one of them be a deal breaker versus the other one not being as big of a deal? I don't know. Um, the answer is probably different depending on who you ask. The key distinction to me is that people view and value those issues differently depending on their environment, their personal experience, and the media they consume. For some, identity issues might really resonate, and for others, class issues are more at the forefront of their mind. To me though, these two issues are closely interconnected, but it just so happens that the media, the mainstream media specifically, loves to hyper-focus on identity because it aligns with a pre-approved narrative that the oppressive system is okay and that the problem we're facing is that we just need more people who look differently to participate in it. So that makes Trump the perfect villain because if you can paint him as the root of all evil and blame all the problems on him, other legitimate criticisms about class exploitation and the political and corporate corruption that surrounds us all can easily be dismissed or at least more easily glossed over. And I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, just like some people can overlook some racist and xenophobic comments when voting for Trump, others are willing to accept a bit of worker exploitation for some everything bagel seasoning for $1.99. But at the end of the day, exploitation, discrimination, it's all bad. And the more we write people off, the more we actively choose to divide based on such distinctions without tolerance, without an attempt to understand the interconnectedness of all of these issues, the easier it is for corporations, politicians, and people in power to manipulate us for their own selfish gain. I get it that a lot of people probably won't necessarily agree with my opinion here, but I think Trump is not a unique phenomenon. Uh, politics aside, because of the exploitative nature of hyper-capitalism, we're asked to make these types of trade-off decisions every day. You know, when you buy something, take a ride somewhere, someone somewhere in the value chain is subjected to discrimination, to exploitation, corruption, prejudice, whatever you want to call it. And I think it takes a lot of time and effort to understand the complexities, the context, and the nuance about a particular topic, a belief, a decision. So if we can, let's try to give regular people the benefit of the doubt so that we can focus our energy on the people and institutions that actually pull the strings. For example, the politicians who exploit their power for private gain. In the case of this video, the corporations that are exploiting workers for profit. And of course, the media who acts as a conduit to normalize exploitation while dividing us all. That is it for today. Thank you so much for engaging in this somewhat meandering discussion with me. Um, your thoughts are always encouraged, so please share them in the comment section below. Uh, if you enjoyed this video uh, and my channel in general, please click on that like button and share this video with your friends and family. Uh, also subscribe if that's something you haven't done yet. As always, I appreciate your time and I'll see you next week.